This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 326, recorded on February 27th, 2015. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello. And you're listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. You see, I got the Alan Dove voice here. Yeah, yeah. You, um, you actually sound a little congested. I am, but you don't usually sound congested. That's not uh, no, no, only when I'm in traffic. <laughs> How's it going out there? Are you, are you like snowed in, frozen, yeah. all of the above? Uh, yeah, we've been kind of permanently snowed in for about a month. Um, I mean, we've got the the streets are cleared and the sidewalks are cleared, but it, it looks a little like trench warfare. You know, people walk by and you just see their heads <laughs> bowed. So, yeah, uh, we're supposed to get more snow on Sunday, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, yet more. Cool, but it might break freezing early next week. Yeah, I briefly did it last weekend here. Oh, no, not here. And then it went away. Also joining us today from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. How's it hey, going? Rich. Good. Excellent. Let me it's, see, 65? Uh, uh, no, 59. Yeah. A little chilly, huh? Uh, yeah, i got to get the conversion for you because I can't do that. Do That's you have, 15, uh, 15 Celsius. you wearing a short sleeve shirt? No. In fact, I'm wearing a long sleeve polo shirt. You know, because for me, this is cold. <laughs> he's, he's, right? a, he's a Floridian now. He's got to be wearing a parka if it's below 60. <laughs> a parka. Yeah, I got a bike home in this, man. So you're, oh. so you're not wearing shorts, right? No, I'm not wearing shorts. I'm wearing a long sleeve shirt, and I'm, wearing, and I'm wearing jeans, you know? You know, I was just sitting here thinking, this is episode 326. Can you believe that? It's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. You guys have been uh, with, on most of them, too. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of them. Are you getting tired? No. You're just noting that it's a lot no, of this is always No, this is always, a, you know, a high point for me. I think it's cool that people want it, and that's why we're at 326. If they didn't, yeah. they listen. If nobody listened, you know. Yeah, it would get boring if nobody was listening. Yeah, because the feedback I find is quite interesting, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The show would also be a lot shorter because we would, wouldn't have any letters. <laughs> yeah, we could do two papers <laughs> like we used to. Speaking of feedback, um, a, a Rich, can you read that first? Oh, before we do that, yeah, yeah I want to just, just mention Diftor Hes Musma. That means live long and prosper. Oh, is that right? Apparently in um, Vulcan. And Vulcan. And uh, Mr. Spock is no longer living long and prospering. He died just today, I think, right? Yep. Yeah. 83. Yeah. Pretty memorable character. Ah, man, he's one of my heroes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah this is big time. As my my wife has been texting me about all this, she's the one who alerted me to this. End of an era. It is. End of an era. I think, uh, uh, who's left? I think uh, McCoy's gone, too. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, McCoy died a number of years and, ago. And uh, how about Scotty? Is he around? That I don't know. I know the uh, Price uh, Watch guy is still around. Uh, yeah. Um, What's his name? Kirk is still Kirk, around. Yeah. <laughs> I recently watched the two new movies by J.J. J. Abrams. You know, they had cameo appearances by the older Spock in them. It's quite interesting. Yeah. Um, and they also had a young Spock, which was weird that they had both, but... Scotty died in 05. Yep, 05. I was just looking that up. And what about Bones? Is he around? He's gone. No, he's, he's gone. gone. So uh, the only... Uh, O'Hara is still around. Right. Oh, right. And the, Michelle Nichols and, of course... Right. Um, right. George uh, Takei. George, George Takei is Decay. around. Yep. Yes. And um, what about the, the uh, checkoff? Is he around? Uh, I don't know. Have you guys seen the new movies, the reboot? I have no. not. You should see them. It's actually, if you like the original, it's interesting because they, you know, they reimagined all the characters and they do a pretty good job. Oh, so wait, you, uh, which one are you talking about? The the. So the last, the last two by J.J. J. Abrams. Yes, right? yes, yes. Star I've Trek and Into yes. Darkness, right? Yeah, they're very good. Yeah, they're very I good. Think. I like those. Walter Walter Koenig, uh, Chekhov uh, is still around. Cool. Okay, good. So we've got half the crew. Anyway. We still fly that thing. 
It's too bad. I'm going to go have to go yeah. back and watch all the TV shows and movies one day. Well, I'm still, uh, I haven't been, I, I've been working my way through Next Generation. I think I'm on season five or something like What's that. What's Next but Generation? I don't even know what that Star is. Star Trek Next Generation. Oh, oh, Star Trek. Got it. Yeah. 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 Have you watched the originals? Uh, well, originally I watched the originals, yeah, but yeah. after I finished this, I'm going to go, I've never like sat down and watched them all in sequence. And after I'm finished with next generation, I'm going to go back and watch all the originals. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool. I remember as a kid watching, I loved it. I just loved it. And, yeah. Uh, it's great oh, stuff. Yeah. Great show. Just, it's, uh, so sad when it got canned, you know? Yeah. It's, uh, but it's, you know, what it's transformative. What, uh, what a deal. So yeah. this is a nice little celebration of leonard nimoy's life we're having here that's nice yes good All right. this character is just memorable right yeah it's really unusual oh, absolutely as a matter of fact you know mm -hmm. uh, a couple of weeks ago i gave my last uh formal classroom lecture as a professor wow and when i left i gave him the vulcan greeting <laughs> yeah, it's good. Did they probably didn't know what you were doing? Oh right? no, they got it. They got it. <laughs> yeah, cool. Well, goodbye, Mr. Spock. Goodbye, Mr. Spock. Thanks for everything. All right, uh, Rich, can you take that first email from Fernando? Sure. Fernando writes, "Hi, Twivers and Lee. Uh, Lee, as in uh, Lee. What's his last name? Feynman. Feynman. I remember John Schuyler." Yeah, you could. That, it's a cool name. I like that. Actually. Yeah. Thank you for another great show. On post PhD career options, you might find my experiences in a different STEM field interesting for comparing and contrasting. I have worked in computer science research for all my career at a nonprofit research lab, industrial research labs, startups, and for a six and a half year stint as a tenured faculty at a top notch research university. I had seven graduate students and one postdoc while teaching, and uh, although two of those finished with a different advisor after I went back to industry. My former postdoc is now tenured faculty at a major research university, and one of my students is also on the tenure track at a very competitive place. Three of the other students went directly or via a short academic postdoc to industrial research positions where they are doing very well. One student has been a longer-term postdoc for personal reasons, but he's now on the tenure-track market. Two students did bioinformatics PhD research with me and a biology colleague, and they had the most complex career decisions. Both ended up at startups, one bio-based and the other in a non-bio role that depends on statistical and computational research skills. In all cases, as in my own, fluency in statistical and computational methods from research work made a big difference. Um, so, uh, he's got more, well, we'll come back to that. Okay. On fitting Ebola virus disease trends with statistical models, the term overfitting refers to choosing a statistical model with so many parameters that they can be tweaked to make the model match closely the observed data at the expense of predictive power for new data. There's much science and art in avoiding overfitting which is critical in much of my research on statistical and computational uh, modeling of data. But a simple starting point is splitting your data into separa uh, separate train and test sets. For example, you could use the first 11 months of data for training and the last month for testing. Fit the model's parameters based on the first 11 months of data and evaluate its predictions on the last month. Even better, do a blind study where Alice selects several train test splits from the whole data. Bob fits his models on, tr on the training sets he got from Alice, and Bob submits the fitted models to Alice for testing. Alice and Bob are a familiar adversarial couple in computer science problems. <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting. So that's, uh, that's uh, quite a success story. I didn't know there were postdocs in computer science i guess well uh yeah um i wonder if other is it just biomedical research where we're lamenting the postdoc situation or is it for all science fields where there are postdocs um i i think it's across all science fields that there are employment problems mm -hmm. um i know physicists 
complain bitterly about uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. situation in their field and chemists as well. The chemistry job market is, has been in the toilet for a number of years. Um, so I, I don't think this is a unique mm. bio problem, but biomedical research is the biggest part of the overall research enterprise, so it's more people. Yeah, Certainly uh, uh, computers is, you do okay in computers. You yeah. have to learn yeah. computer. Yeah, right. Well, you know that it's your your son is a computer yeah. guy, right? Yeah, yeah. Did he and, do a PhD? Uh, yes, he did. Did he do a postdoc? Uh, no. So uh, you don't have to do a postdoc in co no. computer science. I think uh, I'm not sure that that's very common. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're going to do, you know, computational biology or something like that, uh, where it's you know it's sort of a, a, pl a computation applied to something like a biomedical science field or something like that, then then I can uh, I can see where maybe a well, it depends, depends on what you want to do. If you want an academic job, you know, you're going to be looking at a postdoc. Yeah, I think the key is that um, with computer science, unlike virtually all other science fields, uh, there is an enormous and expanding industry that can sop up all the surplus labor. Yeah, right. So you're not going to have too many PhDs in computer science because Google and Amazon and Apple are going to hire you know, thousands of these people. Mm. Um and so it doesn't matter that each uh, each PI in computer science is going to train half dozen or more PhDs because there's enough demand for that. Right. Whereas in biomedical research, you have basically the universities and and government research positions, and then you have industry, which is the biotech companies and pharma, but they're they're limited in their needs. Mm -hmm. Hey, I just had an idea for a position. Tell me what you think. Say, let's say. Every department has a budget for a number of non-tenure track independent positions, which we now call postdocs, but we would ha hire individuals into these positions and they would work together with a PI, but have some recognition as faculty and be independent. Absolutely. I sure. agree completely. So there used to be a sort of something kind of like that. Uh, here and in other institutions where there was a budget to hire, uh, uh, you know, like lab managers mm -hmm. um, or uh, pretty uh, high-end uh, technical staff who could help run your lab. When I first came here, there were several of these positions. They were kind of perks for chairs and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, but, you know, part of, the, part of what you're saying here is the university is going to have to pick up more of the tab. Yeah, uh, and uh, I was think I was thinking exactly this uh, a couple of days ago. You know, they ought to bring find somehow find a way to bring those positions back, but don't just make them super techs. You want to hire PhDs yeah. into the position these positions uh, to uh, really help run the enterprise. Right. I don't think that's a sustainable solution, though. I don't know where they get the money. I, I don't, well, that's the that's the proximate problem, but the long term problem is you're still producing too damn many PhDs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it get ba it gets back to this geometric progression where if every PI trains more than one additional PhD, then you have automatically a population problem. Yeah. So where are they going to go? And the the traditional outlets are all overflowing. Um, and in, in academic research, we've moved increasingly to this model where you know, smaller, smaller and smaller numbers of PIs are controlling larger and lar larger and larger budgets, um, which, you know, draw your own political lessons from that about the wider economy. But the, um, this, this big population of PhDs and this, uh, this gushing pipeline that we've got, if we don't do something about that, we're just going to be back here again in a few years if we find some temporary way of sopping them up. Yeah, the one to one ratio is a problem. Yeah, if you yeah. Don't, if you don't have a growth industry, forget it. It's not going to work. Yeah, right. Uh, Alan, could you take the next one, please? Sure. Varun writes, "Greetings, professors. It's been great a great pleasure to listen to the TWIV episodes as always. Recently, in a couple of episodes, discussions have been chiming in on cost of a science career. I wish to throw in an opinion." Just as any other career, just as in any other career, job satisfaction and financial stability form the basis for choosing a profession. At least in the Indian context, the scenario is alarmingly hopeless. <laughs> Forget about a postdoc position; there isn't incentive for doing a PhD most of the time. The job prospects and recognition are bleak, and are the only reason why there is a hefty brain drain. 
Um, people who have chosen less challenging careers are earning a decent living, while researchers are in the streets instead of carrying on their research work, protesting for their already underpaid salaries to be paid. Some of my colleagues haven't received their research stipend for more than 20 months. Many people who have completed PhDs have no employment opportunities. In a passing line, if I can sum it up, PhD, uh, PhD is too little and a postdoc is too much qualification for employment. Believe me, I have firsthand experience. Such a sort of situation forced me to think if uh, research is a career, if at all, and sends along an article about the, uh, the protests. I've, I'd also seen a couple of news stories about this, the protests going on in India. Um, so they, their stipends have not been raised in years, and they apparently are now not even getting their stipends in some universities. Um, and Varun continues, yes, I have chosen to do a PhD because I, don't, I couldn't think of doing anything else other than research. I quit my job to do a PhD, but my family regrets it. With the current situation, most of us are left with a negative impression of postdocs. In conclusion, I will second Alan's opinion that major reforms are needed and will come only if big players are hit hard with, lack, with a lack of researchers who power the research. We badly need a science tipping point. Statistics back it up. Sorry, Vincent, on this point, I respectfully disagree with your opinion. I look forward to a healthy discussion on this point. As always, thanks for the Twix series. Uh, and a follow-up of my opinion on the cost of science research in India, would also like to cite this Nature article. And um, yes, this one... This is one of the ones I saw where the PhD students in India have actually gone on hunger strike because uh, this is because of the delay in the pay raise. So, well, pretty bad. Yeah. Not good. All right, I don't know what to say because I don't have a solution. No. Right. I mean, that's, I mean, we have made some suggestions, but you know, they're it's not up to us to implement them unfortunately. Yeah, that's, we are, uh, yeah. Who's who's in charge of this uh, Alan and Rich, do you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's not, not me. me. <laughs> it's well, I must say, I'm no longer training any postdocs or graduate students. But, um, you know, if I were starting in this climate, I might think twice about training a lot of people. I'm just hire, I would hire a few permanent people who uh, would stay for long periods and be independent. I think that has a lot of appeal to me. In fact, yeah. we have an email about that later. Which I think could actually be very uh, – the, the usual objection that people trot out to that is, well, you wouldn't be able to produce as many papers and get the publications to get tenure, yada, yada, yada. But I think that's not – I think that's not entirely well-placed. If you have – you know, you think about graduate students in the lab um, – I, I maybe I was kind of an outlier on the low end, but I think all of them go through at least some period of time where they're not very productive. Um, and and so you train up a graduate student, they finally get productive, and then you know they graduate. Whereas if you had somebody who was a permanent researcher who had some degree of independence, not only would they, once established, be more productive, they would also be potentially, you know, taking the research in new in new directions. So that might be a better model all around. All right, the next one is from Johnny, who writes Hopeful as well. And she sent us a document where she writes, she's, the document speaks directly to the advice that is recommended and that I give to parents about immunizing babies before 37 weeks gestational age, which is something we had called for a while ago. The other paragraphs are sent and hopefully received as jolly banter and friendly catch-up from a lawyer listener where the temperature is minus 4C, minus 10 with the wind chill. Loyal listener, not lawyer listener. Yeah, I, I'm having <laughs> pronunciation <clears throat> issues. So she sent a document. Nice. It's a really nice multi-page document, which she spent yeah. time on here. It's like a term paper. Gentle twiv, folks. Are we all gentle? Yeah, most of the time. Greetings from this season's winter wonder. That is wonder if it will ever melt. <laughs> Land of snow and Arctic cold. Sorry to report Boston is overachieving right now. A lot of snow, 101.8 inches. That's a lot of snow. Yeah. Silver lining to all the snow and snow days is the unexpected bonus time families have gotten to spend together. <laughs> That's a nice spin to put on it. <laughs> The additional time with housebound snow angels has allowed the grown-ups in their lives to become reacquainted with runny noses that can't be turned off, fevers that don't go below 39C, 
after both ibuprofen, acetaminophen, and even a tepid bath congestion, post-nasal drip, and retching coughs that bring up leftovers. God. This is my life. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that, was, that was last week. <laughs> I'd hope the reintroduction to some of the common, generally benign symptoms of viral infections and the usually only temporizing, not very helpful measures that are taken has prompted some parents and adults to consider if they have done everything they could to protect their children and themselves from vaccine-preventable diseases and illnesses by any and all means necessary, including immunization. Here, here. She then gives a series of recommendations to the question of immunizing preterm infants. The consensus from the medical, clinical, and scientific sources I checked were consistent. Use the child's chronological age. In an otherwise medically stable premature infant, all immunizations should be given based on chronological, not gestational age or weight. And then she notes three vaccines that may deviate from the usual schedule, Hep B, Rotavirus, and Pelizimumabab. Synergies made by the folks at MedImmune for RSV. The recurring message was that preterm infants, by virtue of decreased gestational age, are more vulnerable and susceptible to life-threatening infections and should therefore be immunized. For the record, a term infant is any child born after 37 weeks gestation. Preterm is 33 to 37, very preterm, 28 to 37, and extremely preterm, below 28 weeks to the limit of viability. As is more evident every day, in sickness and in health, the devil will be in the immune response, toll-like receptors, cytokines, rig eye, etc. When is Immunology 101 for TWIV listeners beginning? Yeah, I love it. We should do a Virology 101 too. I've included some references I came across that I like. They're not in any particular order. I did not do a comprehensive review, but looked mostly at recent pubs for recommendations, guidelines, and updates. Hope this is helpful, and we will put all this up. And, you know, I really appreciate that a busy busy physician is doing this for us. Thank you so much. I think we actually may have challenged her by name. Yeah, I said, Johnny, tell us what you think. Yes. (laughs) And and this is wonderful. I'm sorry. You know, you're busy, you know. No, she's uh, helping out. She writes know, here, great. for all who live outside of Florida's unnatural warmth, keep the faith and stay warm. Hey, Rich, it's unnatural down there. <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> she actually gave a pick of the week, which is quite nice. It is um, days until spring <laughs> countdown. <laughs> How many days until spring? 21 days So f- as of today. That's really nice. And all the uh, references are here. So we will post well, this. Well, this is terrific. Yeah, post this whole thing. And yeah, this so is great. The individual who uh, asked initially, it was a very good question. I hope you're listening and you will see this yeah. because it's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it kind of makes sense that, um, you know, the kid is out of the womb and they're getting assaulted by all the microbes now. So, yeah, they need to be, they need to be immunized on schedule. Well, that's excellent. Thank you, Johnny. Very cool. much. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. All right, now um, we have a paper which was suggested by Robin, and this is a letter just published in Nature called AAV Adeno-Associated Virus Expressed ECD4-IG Provides Durable Protection from Multiple SHIV Challenges. Now, that's S-H-I-V. That's not a knife made in prison. Wait, isn't that when you die and you go with the family sitting SHIV? Oh, right. That, no, that's Shiva, I think. Shiva? Oh, sorry. I'm ignorant. Yeah, so uh, Shiv is S-H-I-V, which is a, a virus, uh, HIV, with the glycoprotein of S-I-V so that it can infect monkeys, and the significance of that will become apparent. This is a multi-author publication from multiple institutions. Yeah. Yes. This is a huge collaboration. First author is Matthew Gardner, and the last is Michael Farzan from Scripps. And then we have uh, Princeton, we have UCLA. Cast of thousands. You Penn, yeah. Rockefeller, Penn, Reagan. Oh, it goes on and on. And, uh, and for reasons that I think will become apparent as we discuss this paper. Now, the, the basic premise here is very interesting, especially to me who studies or has studied, and yes, continues to study viral receptors, that is, the proteins on the cell to which viruses bind to initiate infection, which are absolutely essential, Uh, you would think that making a soluble receptor would be a good way to block virus infection, right? Yes. It would be soluble, it would bind the virus, and it couldn't infect, and it wouldn't be easy to mutate because 
If the virus mutated to avoid the soluble receptor, how could it infect cells then, right? It might not be as good. But they're too smart for that. So many years ago, a company here in Westchester, New York, named Progenics made a soluble CD4 molecule. CD4, of course, one of the two receptors for HIV. I remember this. This was happening right when I was in graduate school. Paul Madden. Yep. Yeah, so he was a medical student here. He founded this company and went to work on this for many years. He's now retired at the ripe old age of 40-something. Mm. And um, this this protein, soluble CD4, and a variant of it, which was soluble CD4 linked to the FC portion of an antibody molecule, which just makes the protein more stable. Well, I was wondering about that. Okay, we can get into that, but you go ahead. Yeah, I think that's the basic. It makes it more bioavailable, I think, is one of the words. But yeah, here we go. Uh, soluble CD4 and the more bioavailable fusion protein CD4IG. Right. So th- <clears throat> this, this protein neutralizes very well, um, more so than any neutralizing a- antibodies, and it w- had a safety profile that was very nice in people. It did go into phase one, but it was just not good enough to be put into people. Of course, it's a protein. It's always hard to give people a rather large protein therapeutically. So the, the FC portion of this, mm-hmm. is, is, it, is it not serving any uh, FC function? It is, as yes. Part of this? Yeah. Okay. So as far as I know, in addition to binding you know, virus, free virus, the, because of the FC portion, if, if it binds a cell, say a, a viral glycoprotein produced on an infected cell, then that cell could be killed by NK cells. Uh, and the virus, uh, can the virus antibody complex be also opsonized? Yeah. That is, right. yeah. taken up and digested by a macrophage or something like that? It could be, right. Okay. So m- multiple reasons for putting the FC okay. on there. Okay, good. All right, so that drug was never approved, never been used. So this is like an artificial antibody in a way, because you're taking yeah. an F domain and sticking a binding domain from something else on it. That's what do right. they call them? Immunoadhesins? Immunoadhesins. The interesting thing, of course, is that CD4 is an Ig-like molecule to begin right, with. Right, to start with. Right. It has Ig domains, and they actually stuck two of them onto the antibody, the FC, and it looks like an antibody. You yeah, know? The, the engineering is getting so wild. It's and didn't, um, uh, oh, didn't you do this with the polio, or did somebody did this with poliovirus receptor and polio at some point? Um, yeah, we did. We, have, we made a soluble poliovirus receptor, which is also an Ig-like protein right? with three Ig-like domains. We made the three soluble domains, and it will bind poliovirus and neutralize its infectivity. Until you get escape mutants. And and we, then we selected for escape mutants, yes, which right. were perfectly capable of replicating, despite my earlier suggestions to the contrary. They could replicate. Wrong <laughs> yes. again, Vincent. Yeah, yeah. so I proved well, and, myself wrong. And actually, wrong. you had done that experiment at the time that company was developing the soluble CD4 yeah. as, a, as an HIV therapy. And um, I don't know, as I, as I was in the lab and looking at those things, I said, "This, how is this going to work? And sure enough, one of the problems they had initially with the soluble CD4 was that it generates escape mutants yeah, with that's HIV. Right. That's right. Um, and the the CD4 immunoglobulin version, the CD4IG, which we're going to be talking about that and its descendants here, um, I, I think was a little better about that, but it had its own issues. Yeah. So, um, the other, so as everyone knows who's listened to TWIV, HIV requires not one but two cell receptors to enter cells, the CD4 and a chemokine receptor, either CCR5 or CXCR4. And a soluble version of CCR5 has also been produced. It never got into people for similar reasons as soluble CD4. But this is very interesting. So it turns out that, and this is completely new to me. I have me too. ignored all of this for years, and I don't know yep. why. So when CCR5 binds to the glycoprotein of HIV, GP120, we'll call it, what binds, and is very important for binding, is a sulfated tyrosine amino acid on CCR5. 
All right. So, so I didn't even know the amino acids were sulfated. Did you guys? Yep. New to me. New to me. Man, so so amino acids can be sulfated. And so this that, is a, some sort of post-translational modification, yeah. right? And yeah. You make the protein and something takes the tyrosines and sticks a, a, a sulfur on it. Yeah. Right. And this helps make higher affinity interactions between proteins. So CCR5, and they, they speculate in, in the original papers where this was discovered, maybe these are all seven transmembrane protein, these these chemokine receptors, maybe that's important for interaction with ligands. So HIV has evolved to bind strongly to this sulfated tyrosine because if you take away the sulfation, the, the affinity goes way down. Okay, so then <clears throat> they made antibodies uh, against GP120, some of which block attachment to CCR5. And here is the amazing part. Yeah, this blows my mind. The antibody is binding the CCR5 combining site on GP120, right? And the bloody antibody has a sulfated tyrosine in the site that's combining with GP120. It completely mimics CCR5. Yep. Incredible. In fact, the sequence of the antibody is what they use in this paper to be like a mimic of CCR5. Yes. It's incredible. Now, Alan, do you remember Bernie Erlanger? Yes. So he used to make antibodies against ligands to try and identify the receptors. Right. Because that's the same thing here. You know, yeah, it's, you, it's the anti-idiotypic network. Exactly. All over again. Right. Exactly. So, <clears throat> so this peptide, this sulfated peptide, which is a mimic of CCR5, it blocks HIV infection. But again, like soluble CD4 is not good enough. So these guys decided to put them together. And this blows my mind because... Who would think that it would work? Yeah, right. exactly. I was just going to say, this is a, <laughs> that'll never work, experiment. So they took CD4, the first two <laughs> domains, they stuck them onto the FC <clears throat> of the antibody, right? And then they took this little pep 15 amino acid sulfopeptide from the antibody that blocks attachment to CCR5, which is basically a CCR5 mimic. And they put it in different places in the molecule. But it turns out if you put it at the bottom of the FC, it works best, right? And so this thing now binds GP120 with incredibly high affinity. And so what's probably happening, right, is that both CD4 and this CCR5 mimic are both interacting with GP120. Yeah, it's like a bivalent interaction. So, yeah. so what is this thing wrapping around to do this? I don't, who knows? Oh, my Maybe gosh. Maybe we'll see a structure someday. Oh, uh, scripts, man. They, sh they could crank it out in, in a weekend. <laughs> Got lots of structure people there. But, you know... I'm trying to figure out, because the way we draw antibodies are a Y, right? And it makes you think, this can't bend. But right. Obviously. <laughs> but the way we draw antibodies is just for our convenience. They're, they're only kind of shaped like that. Yeah, I guess. So, yeah, that, that, when I looked at their, at their little picture of it, I was like, wait, but, oh, no, of course, it's going to be able to fold however it folds, and that's going to get these in proximity. So this is a really good uh, binder of GP120. And it neutralizes um, HIV isolates of all sorts way better than uh, the old soluble CD4 FC alone. All right. And um, this sulfur tyrosine is important for that. It's really remarkable. So it binds cool. GP120. It neutralizes virus. And it binds to GP120 on the surface. It's better than soluble CD4 all around. Oh, here's something else that I didn't realize. The original soluble CD4, one of the reasons it was never used is that it actually promotes <laughs> yes. HIV infection. Yeah, so it's kind of like, although I looked this paper up, although uh, mechanistically it's different than, apparently, than the dengue type antibody enhancement mm. uh, that we've talked about before, in terms of the outcome, it's the same sort of thing. Right. Low, affinity, low affinity antibody enhancing virus infection. So these yeah. are cells, the way they do this is they take cells that, ex that produce only CCR5, all right, not CD4, and they and put virus on them. And so normally the virus would not infect those very well, but if they add the soluble CD4, they, it can infect better. And I think what's going on is that this, you know, the CD4 is binding GP120, and that's thought to expose a high-affinity CCR5 binding site, so that must allow... Okay. No, no infection just via CCR5. Makes sense? Right. Makes sense? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the soluble CD4 or the, or the CD4IG 
was priming the virus to bind exactly. to its second receptor. Exactly, precisely and exactly. And even but this wild thing, ECD4IG, they're the one with the peptide on it doesn't do it not anywhere near as well yeah if right. you look at the figure uh, i think it's figure 1d right. yeah right the blue lines are way yeah. at baseline hardly there's doing a, it at there's all. a little teeny bit of pro- possible enhancement there but it's nothing like the um the cd4 ig right and that kind of makes sense because these antibodies are presumably occupying both the cd4 and CC, ccr5 Binding sites on mm-hmm. GP120, right. so it's not it's priming it and binding it and gumming the whole thing up. So this this new drug is potent, has a, a, a high affinity, and it doesn't in promote infection. So they like it so far in cell culture. Cell culture. Next, they they go into uh, they went into mice. They went into this humanized mouse model. These are mice that have repop- been repopulated with a human immune system. And you can infect them with uh, HIV and, and just determine whether they get infected or not. The paper we did uh, some time ago where Baltimore's group had, uh, produced broadly neutralizing HIV antibodies in mice, I think they used a similar mouse model. Right? Actually, it's more than just they get infected. These They're looking at survival here. That's right. You can kill them. Yeah. You can kill them. And, the, and this uh, molecule protects them. It protects them. Yeah. Well, they just inject it, right? They say they maintain serum concentrations of two to four micrograms per mil. Right, and it protects. They do six mice, and three. Uh, you know, they're all, all the ones that got this soluble molecule are protected. They should have done more. I guess you don't need to, right? Uh, yeah. Well, they're going to go on to the monkeys. That's they're the gonna, they're going to move on to these, a much more expensive. These system. Uh, these mice are, as I recall, uh, expensive and complicated. Yeah. They also look at a wide range of uh, HIV isolates, a bunch that are resistant to neutralization. With um, monoclonal antibodies, they have a whole bunch of those. They have isolates from from patients. You know, as people make viruses, they get resistant to antibodies, so they have a lot of those isolates. And they're and they look at um, broadly neutralizing antibodies. Broadly neutralizing antibodies, also viruses resistant to soluble CD4. Right. Right. And this this E CD4 IG man, it just wipes them all out. It's right. so it, it works against a broad spectrum of viruses, and it works better than most of the broadly neutralizing antibodies. And, and CD4. And, yeah. and CD4. And in the, in the few cases where there are broadly neutralizing antibodies that work better than this thing against some strain, they're not as good against the other strains. Right. So it's a combination of breadth and... and um, and depth, I guess, is the sure. They also have viruses resistant to. They have an antibody that blocks the attachment site on GP120 of CD4, and they've made viruses resistant to that, which we talked about earlier. And and this new stuff neutralizes those guys. I guess the key is having both CCR5 and CD4 there, right? Right. Mm-hmm. It also works against SIV. It works against SIV as well, right? Which is that's. I mean, that's a really broad... Yeah, activity. it's amazing. So that means that we might not have any more spillovers into people if everyone's immunized with this. Right. <laughs> so the, the other important point here is that the IC50, the amount of the concentration of the antibody you need to inhibit 50% is one and a half micrograms per mil. As opposed to like up, uh, upwards of, in excess of 10 for yeah. CD4. And they yeah. say that one and a half... I see 80 is 5 micrograms per mil. They say this is this is sustainable in humans, mm-hmm. which is not something I knew. All right, so it all looks good so far. So they get four macaques, which are pretty expensive, and um, they have to do things a little bit differently for the macaques, right? They can't just – they don't want to just give them antibody. First of all, they make a macaque um, ECD4 IG, right? And then they put the gene for so this. they so the, the meaning what they do is to substitute the macaque FC region of the antibody correct for the right. human one. So now they got the CD4 and the macaque FC region and the peptide. We actually we skipped a step here. What did, we, what did I skip? Uh, um, yeah, I think he's they, getting to it. Well, they they um, before they went to monkeys, they monkeyed around with the ECD4. Um, ah, yes. They they came up with some variants of it that worked better. That worked yeah. better, so they they 
changed a couple of amino acids. Um, they've got this ECD4IG MIM2 uh, as opposed to MIM1, and then they've got another where they did an amino acid substitution yeah. that they thought might help yeah. as well. And they, um, they, I think that one, right? So they, so they did the the neutralization studies with all of those, and they, for some reason, um, and I don't know if any of the any of these gazillion authors are listening but maybe they can illuminate this they they say that their lead compound at this point is this um ecd4ig mim2 mm, right but the one that has the mim2 and the q40a substitution actually looks like it was better mm -hmm. so i don't know why they chose yeah the mim2 anyway so they they played with it and they made it better by a bit and then they um then they proceeded with that, and then they modified it to go into the macaques. So that's the uh, laboratory equivalent of somatic hypermutation. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, yes. They're I, refining their response. Do you so. think, now they didn't mention this, do you think there's a reason why they made these changes? Because they don't mention it in the paper. Oh, I'm uh, sure I, these were not random. Yeah, because yeah. I would have liked to know why this amino acid 40 was changed, right? There must have been some previous data about yeah, that. But, yeah. you know, these short nature papers, you can't really Exactly. The, the editor was probably pounding on them about, it's got to be shorter. So. <laughs> so they put the gene for this rhesus form of ECD4IG MIM2 into an adenovirus-associated vector, right? Single-stranded DNA virus in... And they work on this a lot at Gainesville, I know. That's correct. Right? Yeah, Nick Mushika, right? Nick uh, Musichka. Musichka, Ken, I always Ken, pronounce it wrong. Ken Burns and Nick Musichka developed that as a gene therapy vector here at UF. Wow. And uh, this is still one of the uh, hot spots for research on this thing. Absolutely. And, and for gene therapy in general, AAV is still hot. So we did that paper of Baltimore where they used the same vector or a similar vector to put the broadly neutralizing antibody gene, right? And they made put that into mice and showed that they were protected long term against mm -hmm. infection. Right. So here we were, they're using it to put this soluble CD4 uh, Ig MIM2 in, and they this is incredible. They inject two times ten to the thirteenth particles. <laughs> That's a lot of virus. That's some virus. Yeah. It must have been cloudy. <laughs> yeah, there's a actually uh, there's a uh, actually, two companies here that uh, do vector preps in Gainesville. Yeah, uh, my former uh, postdoc. Uh, two of my former postdocs work for one of them. Nice. Well, because yeah, you know, there's yeah. a lot of there's a lot of uh, clinical uh, studies that yeah uh, sort of come f come through here in some form or another that spun off into these uh, 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 companies that make vectors for people who want to. Who want to do this stuff? You it's know, great. so they're doing like 400 liter vector preps. Yeah, that's what you right. need, and they have to be. Of course, if we're going to use it in people, they have to be good manufacturing yeah, yeah. practice all and all that. GMP, GLP, all that stuff. Yeah, all that good stuff. So, just a couple of words about the AAV vector. We may have done this before, but AAV is a small, single-stranded, uh, uh, naked capsid virus. I think the genome is just like uh, four and a half KB or something. It's really small, and they've taken out everything okay all it has is these uh, dna sequences on the end of the single strand called inverted terminal repeats uh, that are important for uh, maintaining this thing uh, in uh, once it's uh, injected and i'll and i'll get to that so they've taken well the guts aren't much it's just a replication protein and a capsid protein they've replaced all that with uh the transgene, whatever it is that they want to express with an appropriate promoter. And then in an appropriate packaging system, they can uh, produce this so it's packed into the uh, ordinary adenovirus shell. So the ordinary adenovirus, uh, I'm sorry, AAV, adeno-associated virus, uh, caps it. So you wind up with a preparation of virus that's got virus in quotes, right? That's the AAV capsid with a single-stranded DNA molecule in it, most of which is your transgene, but just has these little inverted terminal repeats uh, on the end of it. And then you inject it. These were injected into the quadriceps uh, in high amounts, as we said, and it infects. My my assumption is from this, and this is not uncommon, is that it uh, infects the muscle cells, mm -hmm. uh, and it establishes itself as a, basically as an episome. Uh, uh, I think mostly circular. Um, that's extra chromosomal. 
in the nucleus. Mm-hmm. Does it replicate? Uh, Does it replicate? Uh, it turns over, I think, very slowly, but it yeah. persists for an extremely long. I mean, years. Years. Yeah. Okay. So without it without there and turns out protein. <clears throat> so without rep, it's okay. Uh, yeah. As a matter of fact, the interesting thing. So all of that, and I should. There's work going on here on the replication. I just I've listened to a couple of seminars on this, and unfortunately, I can't in my poor old tired brain access all of that stuff right now. But yes, it works. The, it works without rep. The interesting thing is that when this was being developed, one of the attractive features of it was that it was known that the normal virus with rep, that's the replication protein, could integrate into a highly specific site on mm. chromosomes right. yeah, that was right. basically a non-pathogenic site. So the thinking was that you could use this to get permanent expression of a gene by integrating it into a benign locus on a chromosome, and that would be great. But it turns out that when you take rep out, that doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. So when you make the vector, that doesn't happen. Now it replicates, uh, but it turns out that it persists nevertheless yeah. for uh, indefinitely, basically, uh, so in, as, a sense, in a different form as an episome. Yeah, it's actually even better Yeah, um, because it doesn't integrate at all, but right. you get expression lasting years, so... You know, you've got the right. all the benefits without the potential complications. Hmm. Uh, and as it turns out, probably that uh, integration phenomenon is kind of a sideshow in the normal biology of the virus. Anyway. Right. Okay. That's amazing. It, really it is, is amazing. It is amazing. And, you know, these things are being used successfully, in, in particular in eye diseases. Yeah. Okay? There's right. Uh, right. been some very successful therapies with these things. This is, this is getting real. Sure is, yeah. So they, an interesting twist here is that along with the AAV particles, they put in another AAV recombinant that has the gene <laughs> to produce a tyrosine sulfyl transferase. Yes. They want to make sure that that tyrosine on the CCR5 mimic is going to be sulfated. And I don't know, maybe do rhesus monkeys not do this normally? Or? I don't know. I, I'm I sure think they they're must. Just, you know, they're just making sure here. There are no experiments to. They didn't do any controls without no. that other plasmid. I mean, you. Yeah. We're talking. You know, you've got to be careful how many monkeys you're going to use here. So yeah, you can't do everything you would like to do. But it's not clear that 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 second plasmid was uh, absolutely, no, uh, or that all. second vector was absolutely necessary. But but you know, I'd want to make sure too. They yeah. say. I mean, they say later that it looks like the the protein is fully. Sulfur, sulfur transferase tyrosinolated, whatever mm-hmm. the word is, Full, fully sulfated on tyrosine. Sulfated. So you, you don't know if it's the the plasmid, the, the virus that did that or not. But either right. way, it worked. Right. That would yeah. be something to check in a follow up experiment. But yeah. for the first for the first run, you know, you're going to go through eight monkeys, and you wouldn't want to get to the end of it and say, "Well, maybe it was because they yeah, were sulfur." Right. Yeah. Right. But you know, in people, you'd rather not have to do two, right? Sure. So, you yeah, want, you want to know if, if just yeah that would be that would enough. be like the next thing. And exactly, the interesting so thing is that if you're going to do that and do it successfully, I would imagine that you're going to have to do it in a fashion where every cell that takes up the uh, 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 immunoadhesin vector also takes up the other one. They got to be in the same cell. They right. use like a four to one ratio of the uh, uh, ty- tyrosine sulfonate thing to the immunoadhesin I think to try and make that happen yeah now these uh, so these monkeys were fine they had no adverse events or they didn't report any did they take them to the opera <laughs> <laughs> no they didn't do that <laughs> they could be exaggerating they could be exaggerating could. monkeys exaggerate yeah and then they challenged them intravenously with increasing doses of shiv which is not a knife I understand but it is HIV with the SIV glycoprotein so it will infect the monkeys, uh, and then they they do two twenty, two hundred, four hundred, eight hundred, and it, it pic- picograms of virus at different times up to thirty four weeks after infection. And apparently, this is a lot of virus more than any human would uh, experience. I gather they kept ramping up the doses until all their controls got infected. Yeah, that's what yeah. it looked like to me. So, so it, they do an initial round um, at two hundred. 
and a couple of the, of the controls got infected and none of the experimental ones. And then they bumped it up to 400 and another control got infected and then they bu- but none of the experimental and they bumped it up to 800 and they infected the final control and still yeah, all the experimental. That looks like what they did, infected, yeah. So. None of the inoculated uh, animals were infected. They're all protected. Yeah. And their serum had high titers of neutralizing activity because for, of this protein floating around, for, right? What was it? Weeks? Uh, of the last well, 10 weeks. Yeah, of the, 10, of the 40 week study period, yeah. Of the of the 40, right, they measured concentrations over the, over the final part of the 40 uh, week. That's study. almost a year, right? Yeah. Yep. Two macaques made less than 20 micrograms per mil at the final challenge, but the average was uh was a nice range here which I can't find. But it, they have a lot of this protein in their in their serum. And even the two that were at the low end didn't get infected. Right. So protects them it's pretty Seems cool to. it works and um it's not immunogenic it's less immunogenic than other things like neutralizing antibodies so you, the animals are not making an immune response to this thing that would so that's a it up. that's a big deal with all of these uh, gene therapy vectors uh, right is that if you're going to make in particular a foreign protein that's supposed to be therapeutic over a long period of time uh the the host can uh, make antibodies to the protein and compromise the therapy. And so that that's a really big deal. Yeah. And yeah. so one of the interesting things here is that this thing doesn't give much of an immune response. In particular, uh, in comparison to... Uh, to, to broadly neutralizing yeah. antibodies so, that people have tried. Go yeah. figure. How does that work? I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> Now, an interesting, the next experiment, of course, they have to see if this protects against mucosal challenge, right? Because that mm. is how most HIV is transmitted in people, not by intravenous right. injection, right? Right. So I guess those are ongoing. Yeah, there's actually, I know there's a mouse model for mucosal infection. I, I don't know if there's a monkey model as well, but they... It's those are tricky systems. Now I'm yeah. skating on thin immunology ice here, but I wonder if you swap out the FC domain for something like an IgA or something like that. If you could target the immunity towards the mucosa. Well, Am remember, I thinking it's, about it's, this it's right? The, it's the secretory piece that gets it secreted, which okay. is then taken off. And, yeah. Um, so that w- I don't think that would be enough to do that. You'd have to have okay. the other part. Right. But that could be done, I suppose. But, you know, if you have a high titer in the serum, it will bleed over yeah, that's into right. the mucosa. That's right. Now, so this, this looks good. They have a very uh, potent therapeutic. It's broad, neutralizes a lot of strains. They make this statement. They say, moreover, any virus that does bypass prophylaxis with this drug is likely to bind CD4 and CCR5 less efficiently in the continued presence of ECD4IG and may therefore be less efficiently retransmitted. So, I don't know. If that's correct or not, I think. I think they, that's hopeful thinking. They need to try it. They right. need to push yeah. it and see if they can get some variants out, right? Yeah, right. Anyway, I think this is very impressive. I think it's really cool. It's extremely impressive. Yes, I think. I think it should be a Nature paper. <laughs> oh gosh, that's really bad. I think it should be a JV paper so it could be longer and they could explain more. <laughs> that's right. They could explain more. So what? Uh, who would? Assuming this all works and it gets in people, who would get this vaccine? Wait a minute. Before I say that, I'm just worried about one thing. So this AV vector is going to make this soluble molecule for a long time. I think they should put a kill switch in it. Yeah. I mean, the, they talk about potential side effects of which they see none, but... Who knows? Making a lot of knows? antibody could be a problem. And maybe they do a, a phase one in 10 people, right? And, and weird things happen. Wouldn't you want to be able to turn this off? Good point, because so this is forever, right? You, you yeah. could put a CRISPR or something in it so that you could then put in another vector to, to, to deliver it and, and knock it out. And you should do that now before you go into phase one, right? So, Yeah. My suggestion. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point, because unlike a this – is, this is a gene therapy. Right. This is, right. Not a, this is not a vaccine. This is actually inserting a new gene. But, you know, for ge- normally for gene therapy experiments – when they go into humans, they're treating diseases that are so, um, so serious, and you know these are genetic defects these people have generated, or you know uh, diseases that are having a serious impact on their lives. So you're not as concerned about well, what if the therapy 
has some bad side effect because the disease itself outweighs that. Um, in this case, though, if you're talking about going into healthy people and using this as a vaccine, yeah, the threshold for side effects is much lower. Yeah, so I wonder. I mean, they're setting us up as a prophylaxis, but yeah, I wonder yeah. if it would have therapeutic value as well. So well, with somebody who's already got the disease. Yeah, that would it, probably be the first population to go into. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but the, of course you're never getting rid of the latent reservoir there. So no. Um, but if you could, if you could tamp the virus down. Oh sure, I mean it's just like a triple therapy. You can tamp it way down, but you're, you always got to. In this case, you don't have to take the pill every week or whatever exactly. day, whatever, right? Cause exactly, this, and this could be yeah. that could be a very good deal in poor countries. But the prophylactically, makes a lot of sense because then you don't get infected at all, right? Right. Yeah, but as you point out, what population are you going to do that when? I don't know. Well, I would think that first of all, in in developed countries or whatever we're calling them these days, you know, sexually active people who don't want to worry uh, will likely get it, right? and they can be prophylactically protected. In other countries where it is rampant, you know, like sub-Saharan Africa, it would be nice if it were paid for and everyone could get it, right? Because there are lots of kids who get infected at birth, and it's not their fault. So their mothers should be uh, immunized, and, and they should be immunized, you know. So the whole population probably who is at risk should be immunized, but I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I'd go that far with something that's a new platform like this mm. you know if if this were a conventional vaccine absolutely you know do this do the usual um uh vaccine safety tests that's a very well trodden path and if the thing is safe then off it goes into people and it's a great deal the the issue with the gene therapy i don't think anybody's looked at at doing gene therapy on such a huge population and i think this yeah, yeah, is a sure. This is a road we have to think very carefully about before we go down it, because that's something that you may you may regret later and not be able to take back. That's why I think you have to put a kill switch in it. Right? Even, yeah, even even with a kill switch, though, if you've if you've gone in and you've vaccinated a whole gen or, or gene therapy treated a whole generation of people with this thing, and then you find out your kill switch doesn't work as well as you thought it would. Yeah, it just, yeah. it, but this is this is a very very promising start. It's Looks better than most of the vaccines that have been out there and put. Yeah, it's amazing. It does. So yeah. I'm hoping we see in the next few years. This I don't know how long does it take to get into people. Phase one. Do they have, do they have to do more know. animal experiments? They've done. They two. will. Yeah, they will have to do more animal experiments to get to phase one. I'm sure the FDA would insist on that, but they could potentially have this in in phase one in you know, a couple of years. I yeah. would think. Yeah. And yeah. from there, it's a question of how the phase one goes and um, and the attended issues of doing gene therapy. I, I think when you get to a phase two and three and clinical use for this sort of thing, the, you'd want to aim only at high-risk populations first. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I don't agree. think this yeah. is going to be like the HPV vaccine where you make it universal. Yeah. or right, right. Um, Because we do have an effective way to prevent HIV-1 in rich countries. There are several effective ways. And... Those can be implemented, but in in high risk populations, they're not feasible. Yeah. So this this would be for that. Now, this is of- a cool example of something that you don't know if it was going to work. Putting right. these two proteins together, and it did. Yeah. Yes. Got to take risks, right? I like that. It's really good. Yeah. Neat paper. Right, let's do some email. Robin recommended that, right? It was recommended by Robin. Thanks, Robin. You Excellent pick. Good. Robin. Yep. I actually got it from, so I got onto the Scripps embargoed press release list, ah, which is very cool. nice. The, the lady who's in charge wrote, wrote me through Twiv a long time ago. Said, "Would you like us to send you press?" Re-? I said, "Sure." So I got this one, and um, like the next day, it was published, and then Robin immediately wrote, "He's on the ball." Yeah. Yeah. All right, um, Alan, can you take the first one there? Anthony writes, getting ready to wash the dishes just now. I loaded an episode of TWIV on the PC. I happened to remember my grandmother telling me how as a young girl in the 1920s, she'd rigged up some sort of frame to hold a book so that she could read while doing the dishes. (laughs) I've been concerned that new media is having a bad effect on the population's ability to reason and to concentrate. Thank you very much for all (laughs) your and your team's work on showing that this need not be so. Thank you again for TWIV. Well, thank you, Anthony. So the... the 
podcast is what the old propped up book used to be. That's cool. Yes, that's good. That's really neat. All right, Brandon sent this one. This is great. Yes. Large yeah. Pacific Blue Twiv T-shirt, $25. Principles of Virology, two-volume set, third edition, $160, making 2014 the best birthday and Christmas of his life priceless. There are some things money can't buy. For everything else, there's Twiv. <laughs> So for his birthday, he got Principles of Virology. For Christmas, he got a Twiv T-shirt, and he sent us a photo of himself, yes. Brandon, the happy guy in the middle. It's just great. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And Brandon uh, tells us that he is a, he says, sincerely, respectfully, joyously, and lovingly. Brandon <laughs> is a, a student at Cal State Bakersfield. Is that yeah, CSU? Yeah. Biology major, future virologist, question mark. Go for it. Excellent. Go for it. If you th can't think of doing anything yeah. else, right? Yeah. Don't listen to all of our negative talk. Go for yeah. it, Brandon. Somebody's got to pick plaques. Well, actually, I don't know if anybody's going to pick plaques anymore. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bill sent us a link to a very interesting article, which I would like to comment on, and then you guys can. It's called The Great Unbundling of the University. And uh, it is by Dave Lerner, who happens to be a faculty member here at Columbia University. And, you know, his main point is that the university is ready for disruption. Yeah, the big D word, right? Everything needs to be disrupted. And, um, you know, he's, his argument is that, um, you know, it's expensive to do this and students are paying a lot of money and the universities are riding on you know, NIH money and so forth, and they really have to change. And, and one of the ways that he thinks this is going to happen is through um, online courses and so forth. You know, and I just want to... It's a very good article. I highly recommend it. Um, having Being at a university, I'm a, I, am, I always think about these issues because I walk through the... Columbia campus often to teach my course and I always look at these buildings you know and I wonder how can you sustain this physical plant it's so expensive and these buildings are aging and so forth you have to have a lot of people just to keep the heat on right well I don't think MOOCs are the answer I've made MOOCs okay and I've gone through the whole spiel and the only reasons MOOC works MOOCs work is because you have a university that brings all these faculty together and they <laughs> And they get creative in that university setting. So nobody's going to do a MOOC at home or it's not going to be at the same scale. There's got to be some other kind of um, of uh, disruption. And my my view is that the big universities, the Harvard, Stanford's, MIT's, whatever else, Columbia's, they're going to always be around because they're always going to have students. They're going to have donors that, that fund the programs. And the smaller ones will fall by the wayside because they can't afford it. But, you know, the value of a university is having all these cool people in one place. Yeah. You know, they can talk to each other. Yeah. You're not going to sit home and do that. And I really do think it's pretty cool to, to sit in front of a class and talk with them. I really enjoy discussions, you know, when you have 20 or 30 students and you have a great discussion about something. The other day, I have office hours from 4 to 6 p.m., on Thursdays, and yesterday, three students from my class came, and I said, uh, got any questions? They said, no, we just wanted to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> and they pulled out this paper that we just did today, and they said, we found this paper and think it's really cool. <laughs> so we just, awesome. we just shot this stuff for, you know, an hour, and then they went to class, and that's why I think the university is great, because you can't replicate that. I'm, I tell them, come back, I'm happy to talk about anything, even the weather. <laughs> with you guys. So anyway, that's my two cents. I don't know. I agree. I agree. I think that nothing replaces genuine FaceTime. Uh, I mean, that's why we have I mean, one of the things I think of is uh, study section meetings, right? Yeah, yeah. You've 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 done this where you review grants either over the telephone or even by Skype, and it's just not the same as everybody being in the same room, um, and. Uh, nothing's nothing's going to replace that. I hope, right? Because uh, that's I agree with you. That's where I get my jollies. I, I mean, I think we're going to have changes clearly, but sure. I don't think the university is going to go <laughs> away. Now, David is a is a business professor, and you know, business professors think a little bit differently. They think about making money, and he's actually admits in his column that he is an angel investor in over fifty companies. You know, so he's got a different view. He's got the 
profit view, I think. But this passion view, you know, the teaching. I don't know. Hey, Alan, you got any views on this? Uh a few, yeah. I mean, it's very clearly written by somebody who's in the business world. It's it's just laden with buzzwords. Yeah. <laughs> I found that a little annoying. It's unbundling this and disintermediating, and you know, this, <laughs> these things are going to be the tips of the spear in leading this transformation. It's, oh, come on! <laughs> I um, love it. <laughs> but that's that's the world that this guy lives in. Even though he's he's at a university right now, he teaches people to talk that way, um, which is unfortunate. But there you go. So. But getting to the article, <laughs> I think he makes some good points. Um, yes, you, the some of the functions of the university are being done now in other ways or duplicated in other ways. I, I don't agree that it's going to replace the university in the sense that Craigslist ran the newspapers out of business. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's what he's getting at is that the you know this was your big thing that you provided and now people can just go on the internet and get it from MOOCs and and so now you need a new business model. I don't think that's true. Um, if you look at the online education that's available uh, and the the degree programs that are available online and remember that employers throughout every industry and every part of government uh, everywhere they're looking for degrees and skills in particular areas and in some cases certifications they want somebody who went to college they don't want somebody who sat at home and went to the university of phoenix mm. um so there's a there is a big difference between an online degree and an in-person degree from the hiring perspective. Yeah. Now the online degree is cheaper and easier to get, but what is it really worth? And people who promote the online degrees will say, "Well, that prejudice will fade over time," as yada yada yada. I don't think so. Um, I do not see any point in the future where you're going to be able to get a medical degree online or a nursing degree online and have it be equivalent for licensure to the the in-person experience of that or uh, probably even a law degree. Hmm. Just to pick a few examples. Now, a business degree? I don't know. Um, the That might be possible, but even in that case... A lot of what people get out of business school, especially out of something like an MBA program, is the contacts that they make there. Yeah, right. And the people yeah. from the prestigious business schools go on to lead the Fortune 500 companies. And if you went to some online program that's just as good as a business school, you are not going to be wired into that network. Yeah. So I think there's an awful lot that goes on in the universities. And he, he, um, a learner does credit some of that, that there's this community sense of a university, and, uh, and that's very important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But I think that's actually much more central than he lets on. And the, the stuff that can be replaced by other sources is actually peripheral to what the universities do. Now, the idea of unbundling research and teaching, I think, is an excellent, excellent idea. Um, that is something that got bundled post-World War II by the, the renovation of the research budgets, and, and that's when research became a big business for universities. Um, but that should not be the basis of universities as, a, you know, as part of the teaching enterprise. I think we do need to acknowledge that there's a teaching function that needs to go on there that should be compensated and, and that's that's a different issue. Well, you, yeah, I highly recommend you check it out. It's a nice article. No, it's it is. Yeah, article. Despite despite my critique of the language yeah. of it, it is it is <clears throat> actually an interesting article. Thank you for that, Bill. And thought provoking, as you can see. Uh, Rich, can you take the next one from Harold? Uh, uh, yes. Okay. Twiv Gang, currently seventy eight point eight degrees F, and bright in Cube Land. Cube Land. <laughs> Do you know what Cube Land is? No, an office is full of cubicles. Maybe. Ah. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I would like your opinion. Yeah, of course. Seventy-eight point. Well, seventy-eight yes. point eight degrees. It's a little warm. warm. Right. Yeah, I would like your opinion on two stories that recently appeared in the media. First story on NPR about a helpful virus? Question mark. Here's the URL. Um, and uh, this is a story about 
what is it? What's the name of the virus? I'm G- blanking. GBVC. Oh, GBVC, GBVC, which is a flavivirus. We've talked about this before. That's very common. Replicates in high titers is not pathogenic. Uh, and there's some uh, evidence that it may actually confer some benefit in some, in HIV, actually. Yeah. Uh, that is HIV infections. Uh, what I forget exactly how the data go. It's, just um, a, it's an association, right? Right, it's an association. Yeah. And this uh, particular article makes the same kind of association with Ebola. Struck me as pretty tenuous. Yes. So they had all this sequence from uh, of Ebola isolates, which uh, part of Sabeti had done last year. And these guys at Wisconsin who had this idea looked at the data and they found GBVC, right? And there's an association with better prognosis in Ebola and being infected with GBVC or having in, the sequences, right? In 49 patients that they looked at, yeah. yeah. So I, I, I did a TWIV out there in Wisconsin where these guys are. Um, forgot the number, but... TWIV, um, TWIV 260. 260, and... Um, and my so one of the two of the authors on this paper were on the TWIV or one of them I don't remember and I so my host was Adam Bailey who's the second author on this paper he's a MD PhD student who had invited me out there and I hung out with him he's a cool guy so I wrote him I said really Adam <laughs> 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 isn't there anything else that tracks with protection he wrote um, yes this paper has gotten a lot of traction way more than i think is warranted of course many things track with better survival in the context of ebola infection and we were not able to control for many of these given the very limited clinical information associated with the data set we did try to control for one of the largest variables age when we did this our p-value rose to 0.06 which is what we published we we're very careful to not state that gbvc protects people from ebola we merely wanted to get this out there so People who have better access to samples, et cetera, could investigate. And basically, um, he says, you know, we couldn't get a lot of samples because... Because you can't. You can't. Right? Yeah. And uh, the ones you can get, you have to go into a BSL-4, et cetera. So yeah. that's that. So, yeah, it's a little preliminary, but maybe someone else has access to materials could look at this. this yeah, it's... It's a good paper in the sense that they, they looked at something that other people hadn't looked at, and they saw yeah. something that tells you that somebody else ought to really look at it. Of course, the NPR story presents it in a different way. You know, it's like... That's unfortunate, could this, yeah. Could this virus pr- protect against Ebola? Well, I don't think Well, it that. could. Yeah, it could. A lot of things could happen. Yeah. So his uh, second uh, article that he wanted to point out to us is a Freakonomics podcast exploring why uh, doesn't everyone get the flu vaccine? And he gives a link to the Freakonomics uh, podcast. I didn't listen to the whole podcast. It's about a half an hour long, but I read the article that went uh, with it. And it's, um, you know, most of the usual stuff. Yeah, most that's what I felt, yeah. Mostly, yeah. Most importantly is that, you know, the vaccines are victims of their own success. They work, and so people don't understand, uh, you know, they don't, they don't, commonly see what it is that they're protecting themselves against and so the motivation is yeah not high. Yeah, there, there's a long separation between receiving the vaccine and even the potential to see any benefit right so yeah, yeah that this is the usual things that we've actually talked about before right the free economic skies are getting in on it it's okay all right we're back to alan i believe I think so Dave writes, sick voles shunning one another on account of stinky pee is interesting and all, but another avenue was overlooked. And <laughs> what else is this? <laughs> uh, several times, reports have surfaced of dogs being able to identify some cancers in some people based on the odor present somewhere. Wow. Then they don't get mentioned again for a while. Uh, of course, I don't know if viral particles would have a role in the production of or perception of such aromatics, so maybe it's just digressing further, but the topic did come up care to play with it and even conjecture on any place in it for virology uh, then the weather is becoming unseasonably warm already the rain has been measured as measurable <laughs> sunshine cooks car <laughs> exhaust into smoggy ozone the level of the water table continues to decline and the reservoirs drop would you like to hear me complain about the weather mm. Dave is in Fresno um, 
Right. So this was the story about uh, the voles might might stay away from sick voles based the on pee, the yeah. smell of their urine. Uh, uh. I don't know. And I've seen this know. occasionally about dogs being able to sniff out cancer. Really? Yes. Yeah. Is that from something in the urine? Really? Uh, well, no. I, I don't know what I don't know what it is. There are, there are some dogs okay. that um, there, there's been spotty research on this, but there, there's good enough evidence to say that there is some some ability for some dogs to um, to sniff some kind of biomarker. They they can be trained and they'll they'll uh kind of point or indicate on uh, some people in a group and not others and then those yes indeed are the people who've been diagnosed with a tumor um so they yeah. must be able to smell some sort of metabolic imbalance or yeah, something like that probably yeah. you know viruses i'm sure well we know viruses alter metabolism so yeah, it's sure. highly likely that they do yeah. something to the urine it just hasn't been looked at yeah. And that that vole case was the only one that I'd, I'd seen, but uh, if someone looks in it, I bet they will find altered organics in the urine of certain virus infected people. I sure. bet you could train dogs to uh, to uh, detect different virus infections. <laughs> sure. <laughs> oh yeah. There's sure. a, actually there's a this is a little bit more obvious and off topic, but there's a there's a guy here at the university. Who trains dogs to smell bed bugs? Really? Oh, I've heard of okay. that. Yes, and you can take these bed bugs. Are you know? I mean, it's it's not necessarily easy to uh, diagnose a fairly minor inf infestation with uh, bed bugs that could become major down the road. You take one of these dogs into a hotel room that's got just a couple of bed bugs in it, and they go bonkers. Okay, it's amazing. <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> that's very cool. All right, let's do two more here. The next one is from Lance. So Lance said, don't read this, but remember... Tough, it, Lance. Come on. You know better than that. So this is for the med tech who was considering a PhD in 322. We talked about that a couple of times. You know, she said, I make a lot of money. Should I get a PhD? And so I, instead of looking for her email, I just thought we'd read it. Because you're, you're still listening, right? Should be. I have an MS and PhD in virology, no postdoc or industry experience, taught adjunct for a year and a half, then worked in a public health lab and now work as a med tech. What I would tell her is that the hours much better and pay slightly better as a med tech are typically better than my postdoc peers, which is almost every PhD I know. I have a higher degree than everyone I currently work with, including my supervisors. If you really want your PhD, I would recommend making sure you have your med tech ASCP certifications, get a PhD, and run a public health or clinical lab. If you want to do research, try to pair with MDs or an academic lab. P.S. I won't ruin your day by telling you what the weather here, Honolulu, is like. Didn't they? Didn't Honolulu have some, or, or Hawaii? Didn't they have some kind of storms recently? I don't know. I'm not that I'm aware. Of. I thought there was something about that. Uh, Rich, you're the last one here from Johnny. Johnny writes. Uh, sternutation is that how you pronounce yes. it? Yes, sternutation. Gesundheit. <laughs> what did we did we mention this word at some point in the past? I don't know. I don't think a so. A word associated with some viral URIs, upper respiratory infections. Definition, the act of sneezing belongs in the lexicon of symptoms I just, or signs. I, in other words, I just sternutated before. Yeah. Yes, you did. Ah. Dictionary.com, she's got a pronunciation, noun, the act of sneezing. Quotes. It was a very high-pitched sneeze, a most delicate sternutation, the merest zephyr tangled in a pretty powdered fingertip of a nose. Wow. That's from, uh, the quote is from uh, Eric Linklater, Magnus Merimum, 1934. And the origin is sternutation derives from the Latin verb sternuere, meaning to sneeze. It entered English in the mid-1950s. 1500s. Uh, 1500s, I'm sorry. I like a most delicate sternutation. <laughs> That's a good title, isn't it? Yeah. Most delicate sternutation. All right. Let's um, do some picks of the week. Sure. Rich Condit, is it necessary to do a sit rep? Uh, you know, two seconds. They're still down. They're playing whack-a-mole. 
Yeah, they're still down. Yeah. I looked it up. They had over the last week. They had ninety nine cases. Um, and uh, this still, is Ebola, by, by the way, for yeah, people. Right. Sorry, yeah. folks. Sorry, they're still trying to you know get the last few, and um, uh, it's hard. Ninety nine cases yeah. uh, last week. Okay, yeah. we're way down. Ninety nine cases of Ebola on the wall. Yeah. Oh dear. Well, the good news is that it's going away, right? Yeah, it is. They're doing the right things, and it's having the the right effect. Good, excellent. Alan, what do you have for us today? I have a book that I just finally got around to reading recently. Um, this is by uh, a former colleague of mine. I um, uh, Dan Fagan runs the Science and Environmental Reporting Program at NYU, where I was an adjunct for a while until I moved completely out of the New York area. Um, but uh, he has been working on this book for uh, must have been years, and <laughs> it finally came out a little while ago, 2013. Um, it won a Pulitzer Prize. Nice. And um, so, yeah, I was <laughs> I was impressed at that point. Um, I, I knew Dan was an excellent writer and reporter, but this this is the the proof of it. And I finally, as I say, I finally got around to reading it, and it is awesome. Hmm. Um, this is the story. Well, it's Tom's River, New Jersey. Um, this is why people associate New Jersey with chemical pollution, pretty much. <laughs> um, if you were wondering, so Tom's River, there was a. Um, a uh, big chemical plant built there by Seba, uh, and uh, Dan goes into the history of why they built there and what they did, and then that led to various episodes of contamination by Seba and by uh, actually Union Carbide, and then subsequently people started to uh, develop problems of various sorts, including what could have been a cluster of cancer in kids. And so that led, of course, to lawsuits and years of back and forth. And um, and it, it sounds like the kind of story that you really wouldn't want to read about, but it is absolutely riveting. It's, uh, it's environmental epidemiology explained in the context of, the, of what the effect was on this community. Um, just really well done, uh, and uh, and at the end of of this whole, it won't be much of a spoiler to say at the end of all this, um, none of the participants actually got what they wanted. Uh, mm. So it uh, it really nobody was terribly happy with the way this all went down, but it is this huge landmark incident and series of cases in in the history of environment of environmental epidemiology and and really a lot of it made the modern history of environmental epidemiology so just an absolutely fascinating read and i recommend it highly and i think the pulitzer committee was right on cool i know this story because our um summer home is just a few miles from tom sure River. and um I, so we had a uh, a guy here working here years ago he lived in, in the town next to tom river and his his father got involved in this so the the plant had an had a had a dump a pipe that went all the way to the ocean. Yep. And in this area, there was a high incidence of nose cancers and surfers, apparently. And mm. so this guy who used to be a tech here, his dad got involved in this and had that thing concreted up. But the company, you know, diverted the the waste elsewhere. But for years, they were just dumping it in the ocean. And I remember when I was a kid that the water was always cloudy, right? And now it's crystal clear. You know, they don't dump as much stuff in the ocean, but uh, this was a big deal. Everyone probably probably about. what you were seeing that was cloudy was actually the sewage outfall, which also ran directly to the ocean. Yeah, I'm sure. So there was it, it's this story is just absolutely. I think it's fascinating, and I and I think it does a great job of explaining the history of it. All that that you just mentioned, including the people trying to trying to clog the pipe. Yeah. Um, but it also explains the the incredible difficulty of figuring out the seemingly simple questions like, is there a cancer cluster? Yeah, right. <laughs> and, um, and it really presents it in a way that's quite readable, I think. So many years later, um, uh, can I diverge a bit? Absolutely. Go for it. It's your podcast. Yeah. Well, I don't want to bore you guys or the audience, but ah. this will be quick. So um, the town I live in, 
No, no, I don't live there. It's our summer home. It's called Lavalette. It's right next to Tom River. At some point, <clears throat> the town decided to coat. So the, the, the water pipes were, um, was it the water pipes? Yeah, the water pipes were leaking. They were losing a lot of water. And they decided to coat them with epoxy. Right. All right. And now the town engineer, it turns out, had, had a company that made this epoxy, which had never been used in a drinking water pipe, but had been used to coat waste lines in Navy ships. So they said, well, why not? You know, epoxy, you mix two things together, right? They polymerize. And so they just did this without asking anyone's permission. And they did it in the winter. And this guy who I just mentioned who was involved in the, uh, the dye plant uh, waste into the ocean, he got involved. And he said, this is ridiculous. This epoxy could be in your drinking water and, you know, this could be bad. This is yeah. repeated all over again. So I got involved in this. I actually got a bunch of scientists here at Columbia to sign a letter saying this was a bad idea. And I went to a hearing down there and testified. Not testified, I just talked. And so finally they put a camera down and they, they actually took up some pieces of pipe. You know, the epoxy had like lumped on one side of the pipe. <laughs> How you could possibly spray this evenly throughout all the pipes and, and seal them, right? Right. But the epoxy was just sitting there. And so eventually they put out a, a referendum to replace all the water pipes and it passed. And I like to think that we had some role in that because we, we sent out letters and we told people, you know, it's not a good idea to uh, drink this water. It's probably messed up. You definitely need to read this book. I, you probably know some of the characters. I'm in sure. It. I'm sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, Rich Condit. Uh, when John Schuyler was on the show, uh, he, I, he writes science fiction. I asked him to recommend to me his favorite science fiction books, and one of them he recommended was Spin. Ah, right. And I went right out and read it. You did, and huh? It's, and it's great. <laughs> Good. I really, I really enjoyed it. Uh, so there it is. I won't say anything more because anything I say would uh, would give it away. It's a Hugo Award winner. He said I had some correspondence with him. He said he was reading all the Hugo Award winners, which is a, a cool. science fiction top prize. Yeah, that's right. Nice. And uh, that's. You know, I had been tempted to do that some time ago, and I ought to, now that I'm going to have some more time on my hands, get back into that, because that's a good idea. Read all the Hugos and then read all the Nebulas. Yeah. At any rate, Spin is pretty good. It's pretty creative. All right. I'm getting both of these books today. Okay. I got The Martian on your recommendation. That was great. So I'm going to get both of these. Okay. Uh, my pick is something that's happened recently, which is really important for all of us, especially us here on TWIV. We use the internet. And you may know that the FCC voted recently for uh, to to make things that would improve net neutrality. Basically, you know, a ban on paid fast lanes and so, and so forth. So, uh, internet service providers cannot mess around with the internet; they can't control it. And this has been a contentious issue, right, for a long time. The internet service providers have been fighting like crazy against this. They basically, FCC wants to reclassify the internet uh, as a telecommunication service so that now they can uh, regulate it, right? Because right. Presum pre previously they could not. I think this is going to be challenged, right? Um, and it's a highly politicized right thing because the, the Republicans don't like this and the Democrats do. But when you think about it, the internet should be uh, open, you should be able to get your stuff on there. You know, it could be that us podcasters one day would have to pay a lot of money to distribute our stuff according yeah. to the ISP. So, this is really important. I just hope that it can be uh, upheld. So, this is an article by Ars Technica that just uh, described what happened, and I think it's really important for all of us. Yep, I you know. agree. Yeah, cool. I'm, I favor this. I think it's a it will it will increase the total cost of running the internet. Um, but I think this is the right way to go because it is a telecommunications service. Of course, absolutely. Uh, we have a couple listener picks. We have um, one from Neil who writes, Hi, Vince and co-host. Here's my suggestion for a pick my, from my second favorite podcast, Freakonomics. <laughs> well, maybe tied for second for with NPR, and basically it's the uh, podcast we just talked about, why right. doesn't everyone get the flu vaccine? By the way, there must be some kind of critical mass of TWIV followers now. I met a fellow TWIV fan, fanatic, somewhat randomly at a social gathering recently. Lisa from Berkeley in TWIV 228 
It was a Christmas party hosted by a hockey-playing friend who works at Genentech, so perhaps not more than a few degrees of separation from science-minded people. Thanks, as always, to all you do for fantastic work and dedication required to produce such an educational and entertaining podcast. I can't tell you how many times I've been asked about the Ebola outbreak recently, to which I respond with information gathered by listening to you guys. And one more thing. I keep meaning to send to you. If you are using Safari and want to prevent videos from autoplaying when a web page loads, install this extension. There you go. That's good. Neil's in California. Fernando sends a link to humor. Zombie Jonas Salk raises from grave to hunt idiots. This is a, <laughs> this is by Andy Borowitz in the New Yorker. <laughs> this is good. Yes, Borowitz is a riot. I really like this guy. We have reason. So basically, this is the reanimated corpse of Doctor Salk has arisen uh, to to look for idiots who don't vaccinate. And according, uh, we have reason to believe he's coming for Governor Christie, said a staff member. <laughs> yes. Fortunately, the governor is never here. <laughs> this is very funny. <laughs> Thank you, Fernando. And finally, from Neva. Hi, Professor's Grand, a possible pick for a TwivCast. This article seems a good overview for discussion. My good friend, a retired physics professor here at UTexas, says he hangs out with biologists more now, and figuring out the aspects of convergence and approaches of several fields is great fun. Always find your podcast fun, too. Best, Neva from Buda. It's in Texas. Physicists in biology, inverse problems, and other quirks of the genomic age. This is the curious wave function. The, you know, the, this is about the interaction between different scientists. Uh-huh. You know, this is a big deal. The, this, got the, this got virology going because a physicist, Leo Sillard, uh, came over to, to work on phages, and he, he gave his quantitative views to the field, which was very important. So this is a, an interesting idea that needs to go on. Yeah, we all you need to talk and interact and learn from one another. So that's cool. Thank you, Neva. And that will do it for th- TWIV 326. And you can find this and all the others at iTunes and at TWIV.tv. And please do send us your questions and comments. We absolutely adore them. TWIV at TWIV.tv. Alan Dove is at Turbid plaque.com and you can find him now and then on twitter try it out thank you alan always a pleasure rich condit is at the university of florida in gainesville where he has just given his last lecture thank you rich sure enough great time good fun you know you should have recorded your last lectures uh too bad (laughs) we we have a guy (laughs) actually actually they're on uh they record all the lectures for the medical students here oh good so uh so it is recorded rich needs to be archived you think so yeah Yeah. for sure yeah i already am on twiv we have (laughs) you are it's true we have a a famous history professor here eric foner who is the 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 civil war expert of the world right and he's teaching his last course this year Mm. and so they're recording uh, all his lectures and doing it fancy you know because it's a big deal because he said i think i'd like my last year to be recorded so they're doing that that's pretty cool cool, cool. Uh, maybe i'll make that a pick sometime because you can find that and i'm vincent racaniello you can find me at my blog which is virology.ws you've been listening to this week in virology thanks for joining us we'll be back next week another twiv is viral <laughs>